Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Good. Well, I'm here to welcome you officially to the University of Washington Tacoma. You're in the University Y, so I'm glad you found your way here today. We couldn't be more excited to see so many people here for this exciting event this evening. Uh, and I got to tell you ahead of time, we have several events this evening. So after I welcome you, I'm not going to be rude, but I have to go welcome another event down in Bill Phillip Hall right after this. So uh, anyway, uh, tonight's uh, event is, is very special because it's right in the wheelhouse of what we do on this campus. So we're the University of Washington's urban serving university. Uh, and what that means is our faculty uh, do their teaching, do their research, and do their service with the issues that are important to this community, to this time and this place uh, in the classroom and with their projects. So that is what we ask all of our faculty to do. So that's what they're doing tonight with this particular panel. Uh, and the University of Washington Tacoma doesn't always just go out and teach the community or the students about things, we invite the community in because learning is all of us together. We do this together. Uh, and I probably need to learn to tell you my name. I think, <laughs> I think I forgot to do that. My name is Mark Pagano. I have the privilege of uh, serving as the chancellor of this campus. So uh, tonight's event, uh, you're gonna hear from some distinguished guests uh, around the, the table here. Uh, and the topic uh, is also not only relevant to our community, it's very timely to this time and place as well. And I also have to do a little shout out too, is um, this department, which is hosting you tonight, uh, politics, philosophy, and uh, public affairs as a very engaged department. Uh, and successfully this year, we were able, to, along with community members, to convince our state legislature to fund us for a legal pathways program that's going to be layered on top of some of the programs we have here on campus already. We're very excited about that. Our community members got behind us, and our wonderful late legislature, including a couple people in the room here, uh, helped get that funded. So we're excited about that. So uh, welcome. I, I hope you all have a, a good evening and uh, have a safe trip home. Thank you. The Sixth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution provides that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. I'm Salvador Munji. I'm a past president of the Washington State Bar Association, and I'm a partner with the law firm of Gordon Thomas Honeywell, where I've practiced here in Tacoma since 1986. I'm here to introduce tonight's program, our panelists, and our moderator. In the late 1950s, Clarence Gideon was charged in Florida with breaking and entering into a pool room with the intent to commit a misdemeanor. That was a felony in Florida. Mr. Gideon appeared in court without an attorney. He could not afford one. Mr. Gideon asked the court to appoint an attorney for him. The court said, Mr. Gideon, I'm sorry, but I cannot appoint counsel to represent you in this case. Under the laws of the state of Florida, the only time the court can appoint counsel to represent a defendant is when the person is charged with a capital offense. I'm sorry, but I'll have to deny your request to appoint counsel to defend you in this case. Mr. Gideon responded, the United States Supreme Court says I'm entitled to be represented by counsel. Unfortunately, at that time, Mr. Gideon was wrong. In fact, the U.S. Supreme Court just 21 years earlier held just the opposite, saying in state courts, not federal courts, but in state courts, you are not automatically entitled to court-appointed counsel. In that case, 21 years ago, the court said, you know what, appointed counsel is not a fundamental right. It is not essential to a fair trial. Well, Mr. Gidden did his best to conduct his defense. He made an opening statement, he presented witnesses, he declined to testify himself, and made a short closing argument. The jury returned a guilty verdict. Gideon took his case to the US Supreme Court, where a little ironically, the court in fact appointed counsel for him to represent him before them. It was a chance of redemption for a US Supreme Court, and in fact, the court overruled its earlier decision and held that in fact, in state courts, a criminal defendant is entitled 
to appointed counsel because it is so essential. It is a fundamental right and is essential to get a fair trial. Where, where are we now? 55 years later, when we have to ask ourselves, where are we? We know that having counsel is a fundamental right, essential to a fair trial, but attorneys cost money. What happens when the government doesn't pay, or at least doesn't pay enough for those costs? Especially during lean budget times, it's not uncommon for the state and local governments to look for ways to cut the budget, or at least make the budget balance. Just a few years ago, 58 members of Congress wrote a letter to the uh, Speaker of the House and the Minority Leader expressing their grave concerns that, in fact, funding for public defense at the federal level was placing the Sixth Amendment right to counsel in jeopardy. Just a little four years ago in Seattle, in federal district court, a suit was brought against the cities of Mount Vernon and Burlington, where the claims were that those two cities knowingly, knowingly, we're not providing enough resources, in other words, enough money to fund public defense. The matter went to trial and federal district court judge Lasnik found against the cities, found that in fact they weren't funding adequately. And he wrote in his opinion, plaintiffs have shown that indigent criminal defendants in Mount Vernon and Burlington are systematically deprived of the assistance of counsel at critical stages of the prosecution, and that those policymakers have made deliberate choices regarding the funding, contracting, and monitoring of the public defense system that directly and predictably caused the deprivation. The appointment of counsel was, as the court stated, for the most part, little more than a formality, a stepping stone on the way to a case closure or a plea bargain having almost nothing to do with the individual indigent defendant. The problem of limited resources plays out in many aspects of governmental funding. We see it all the time, but tonight we're going to be talking about the importance of public funding, the challenges to necessary funding, and the consequences of inadequate funding and what is being done about these challenges. I'm going to induce our panel now, and I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical order, Reverse, sorry, Steve, because I know that you would normally get introduced first. Um, but instead, starting with Pierce County Councilman Derek Young. There, you got to go first for a change. Rare. I know, Rare. that's why I'm doing this. <laughs> he is a Pierce County Council member serving County Council District Number 7, which represents parts of Gick Harbor, uh, Key Peninsula, Fox Island, Town of Reston, West Tacoma, North Tacoma, and McNeil Island. You are all over the place. He attended the Peninsula Public Schools, and after coming home from college, he worked in the private sector in finance and consulting. At age 21, he was asked to run for Gig Harbor City Council, winning election, re-election three more times. He spent 16 years leading locally and regionally on growth, transportation, and budget policy before being elected to the county council in 2015. Council member Young currently serves on the following Pierce County Council committees, economic and infrastructure development, community development, public safety, human services, and budget and ad hoc committee on budget. Welcome to tonight's panel. Next, we have Kanani Palafox. She's a UWT law and policy graduate. In other words, this is your home right here. And now a legal assistant at the Pierce County Prosecutor's Office. And a little note, you are a graduate of Lakes High School, which was my crosstown of, um, arrival, just oh. have you know, being a Clover Park graduate myself, but probably just a few years before you graduate <laughs> from Lakes. <laughs> Ms. Palifax has an associate's degree in social science from Pierce College and a bachelor's degree focused in law and policy from the University of Tacoma, uh, University of Washington, Tacoma. She has worked with the Fair Housing Center of Washington on civil rights and social action. She's been an investigative intern for the Pierce County Department of Assigned Counsel and a junior counselor for the Association of Washington School Principals. Welcome to tonight's panel. Next on my far left is the Honorable Elizabeth Martin. Born in Wa uh, Rochester, Minnesota, yes, at the Mayo Clinic. As the daughter of a Presbyterian minister, she led the nomadic childhood typical for a preacher's kid and lived in the Midwest in various places until age 11 when her family moved to Vancouver, Washington. She graduated from the College of Idaho with uh, honors, then went on to graduate from William uh, Willamette Law School, again with honors. Uh, she clerked for the Honorable 
Judge uh, Justice Stafford at the Washington State Supreme Court before joining the law firm of Gordon Thomas Honeywell, uh, where we were partners for many years, where before she joined the bench. In 2010, when she was appointed by Governor Gregoire to the Pierce County Superior Court bench, she now serves as the presiding judge of the per Pierce County Superior Court. Welcome, Your Honor, to the night's panel. To my immediate right is Mary Kay High. She is the chief deputy with the Department of Assigned Counsel. Ms. High has been a practicing criminal defense lawyer since 1990. She received her law degree from the Univers University of Washington Law School with honors in 1990. While in law school, she was admitted to the PhD program in social anthropology and conducted postgraduate work at the University of Washington Anthropology Department. Since 2006, Ms. High has been the senior fel felony attorney and is currently is the chief deputy at the Pierce County Department of Assigned Counsel. She is what is known as death qualified, which sounds pretty <laughs> ominous. Sounds scary. Uh, it is very scary. And she's responsible for all phases of serious felony defenses. Welcome, Ms. High, to tonight's panel. To my immediate left is Ms. Don Farina. She's chief of staff of the Pierce County's prosecutor's office. As chief of staff, Ms. Farina is the senior deputy prosecutor responsible for overseeing the three divisions of the prosecuting attorney's office, office with a staff of more than 200 personnel. Ms. Farina develops and administers policy, personnel, and budget decisions to ensure the effective and efficient daily operation of the prosecuting attorney's office. Ms. Farina joined the office in 1990. In her 23 years as a deputy prosecutor, Ms. Farina has prosecuted hundreds of criminal cases, including robbery, kidnapping, rape, domestic violence, child abuse, burglary, and many others. Ms. Farina is a graduate of the University of Puget Sound School of Law and is a graduate of Washington State University. Welcome, Ms. Farina. Now, to my far right, State Senator Steve, uh, Steve O'Ban. He's a Washington State Senator serving the 28th Legislative District, which includes parts of Pierce County, uh, includes Pierce County, including Fircrest, University Place, Lakewood, Stillicum, Tillicum, DuPont, parts of Tacoma, Graham, Spanaway, Anderson Island, Ketron, McNeil, and in McNeil Islands. Nice. You are also spread all over. Nice. Yeah, you got it all. Mr. Uh, Senator O'Ban attended the University of Washington and Seattle University School of Law and has practiced locally for 27 years where he fought where he focuses his trial practice on civil rights, employment, and business. And it's my understanding, Senators, you were formerly a public defender. For all of five months. OK, so you can bring that perspective. <laughs> and then moderating our, tonight's panel, I'm going to welcome her up now to the stage, is Professor uh, Sarah Hampson, who is an assistant professor in politics, philosophy, and public affairs at UWT. Her PhD in political science is from the University of Connecticut. Her research focuses on work and family policy in the United States from a socio-legal perspective. Dr. Hampson specializes in public law and American politics. Her writings include a recently published book, The Balance Gap, Working Mothers and the Limits of Law, an article entitled Hillary Clinton, Symbolic Empowerment and Intragroup Emotions that she's co-authored with Evelyn Seaman in the Dubois Review, and then in an edited volume, Mothers, Military, and Society, published by the Demeter Press. Ms. Hampson, please welcome to the panel and start the presentation. And welcome you all. Good evening. It's great to see so many people here tonight. Um, thank you all of you very much for being here. I'm gonna give you a little bit of an idea of how we'll pr uh, proceed with the questions. Um, so I've uh, formulated a few uh, questions um, that I'll present as moderator, and then we do have some time for audience questions. So if you were handed a card as you came in and you would like to write down your questions, there will be people coming around to collect those um, shortly. Um, so what I will do is um, each of the questions has sort of been formulated with one or two of the panelists in mind, um, and they've been sort of told about who's, who's uh, in mind for which questions. So um, uh, I will direct questions toward certain panelists, but if we have time um, and others would like to jump in on a particular question, we should be able to do that as well. So uh, our, my first question um, is I'm directing at uh, Derek Young, um, but also Mary Kay. 
Um, I, uh, Mary Kay, hi. I, I think um, what we're here really is about the question of why funding public defense in Washington state is so important. Um, do you both want to speak a little bit to that? Would you like to start? Yes. Would you like to start, Mary Kay? Um, your choice. Go ahead. I'm okay. Well, um, you know, I think that it's, it's very, very clear that one can imagine how unfair it was for defendants before the decision in Gideon where the state had their lawyers, people that had money could hire lawyers, but those that didn't have money would face a criminal prosecution without an attorney to help them challenge the evidence or make objections. And, you know, I think that it's very obvious, and that's what Gideon tells us, that probably the strongest indicator that lawyers are essential is the fact that everyone that can have one in that courtroom had one. The state had one to prosecute. Those that could afford to hire one had one. And it was only the poor that didn't have the money to hire a lawyer that had to suffer under this unfair and unjust system. One of the things that we know um, is that there can be no equal justice where the kind of trial a person gets depends on the amount of money they have. And that also is from our Supreme Court. So when we had Gideon v. Rain Wainwright, it really transformed um, how we thought about social equality, social justice, and what is actually fair. And it's sometimes held, and I think commonly held, that having a lawyer is the most essential right you can have. Because without the lawyer, you usually don't have the ability to kind of access or assert any of your other rights. You know, in the state of uh, Washington, um, you know, we've, we've had some bumps. I think you heard from Sal Mangia about uh, Mount Vernon. And a couple of uh, uh, jurisdictions have had some problems. And our state really responded to it. And one of the things that, as we assessed, what does a public defender need to do their job? I mean, it's clear that public defenders face some particular obstacles in seeking equal and fair justice for their clients. And that's one of the things we look at now are caseload limits, attorney qualification standards, um, obligations to use uh, investigators, scientific or medical experts, the kind of experts you might need in a particular case, and that you basically have the resources to meet your ethical obligations and their unnecessary response you know, to the demands of providing adequate defense. And so what we have here is some systematic litigation that took place. Uh, we had a, a variety of uh, some counties and some other jurisdictions that were not living up to the promise of Gideon with lawyers that were handling more cases than they could ever possibly handle properly. Mount Vernon, where they didn't really do trials. I mean, it was just kind of a plea machine, a docket machine. They had no private communications with their clients. And, you know, recognizing the need for some guidelines, you know, we've had national organizations like the ABA weigh in, our uh, defense organizations here in the state of Washington, and then our state actually adopted the caseload limits and the qualification standards that um, public defenders must, must meet. And so they give us a framework, they ensure the professionalism, um, and they acknowledge the demands that it is an adversarial system, and this is what's needed to protect the individual rights. In our office, we do that. So in our office, when an individual uh, is accused of a crime um, and they uh, can't hire their own lawyer, we're able to provide a lawyer and not only just provide someone with a heartbeat and a bar card, but someone who's going to have the resources to actually assist this client. You need to understand that in Pierce County, over 90% of individuals uh, charged with a crime um, qualify for a public defender. So clearly, you know, the poor are very much impacted by the quality of defense that they're, in, that they're able to receive. Our office as well represents individuals in other areas where people are also entitled to an attorney. And that includes children, that includes parents, 
uh, who are in danger of losing their children, the mentally ill that are looking at civil commitment, and uh, a few other arenas there, including uh, sexually violent predators. All these individuals are entitled to lawyers, and in some of these areas, it's almost 100%. Our juvenile clients, you know, whether they be truant or charged with a crime, up just about 100% are going to be provided with a public defender. And it's really important that the public defender, in our case our lawyers, um, have the skills, stay uh, abreast of the changes in the law which have been really uh, moving quickly with respect to juveniles, the, the understanding of the juvenile brain and how that should really affect your practice. And in every case, we need to have, have the opportunity and the time. And I think caseload standards are a perfect thing. If you have too many cases, no matter how dedicated you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how, uh, how hard you want to work, if you don't have the time to work this case, if you don't have the time to meet and uh, investigate a case, you're not going to be able to do it. So I, I don't think there's really a lot of debate that having a public defense system like DAC in place that is working, I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I don't see Department of Assigned Counsel as being in crisis. When you take a look at some of the materials that were attached um, as we prepared for this, yeah, this is not Missouri, Tennessee, Louisiana. This is not, that's not the system that we have here. And we really have a lot of people to thank for it. And that, um, you know, includes uh, a lot of folks sitting around this table and some of the folks here in the audience. And so when we think it's important, I got to tell you it is because if we, can't provide justice to everybody in our community, regardless of their age or their socioeconomic status or their color or their nationality, then we are failing everybody. Thank you. Uh, Derek Young, do you want to speak a little bit to your op-ed as well as uh, this question of why funding public defense in Washington is so important? Certainly. Uh, and before I get going uh, for the students in the room, uh, just know that uh, even though I used to work at Gordon Thomas Honeywell with a couple of others here, that was on the government affairs side, so I'm not legal counsel. So anything I say about the law, just take it with a grain of salt. Um, <laughs> so I, I, um, I need to first kind of back up to uh, the reason that this is kind of all here, and it was uh, uh, as a result of an op-ed that I wrote earlier this year, uh, and it's in my capacity as co-chair of the Washington State Association of Counties Legislative Steering Committee. So I spent a lot of time in Olympia basically trying to convince uh, Senator Roban and his colleagues uh, to do things that counties want. Uh, right now, our, our major priority, and frankly, it's narrowing down to our only priority in some cases, and it's fully funding um, uh, indigent defense, or more broadly, the criminal justice system in general. And so this is where you need to understand a little bit about where counties uh, come in. Uh, so many of you probably think of counties as sort of like not cities. So wherever you have a city, the outside of that, that's county government, right? Okay, so that, that is true. We do provide direct local services, land use, police services through the sheriff department, uh, and a number of uh, roads, things like that. Uh, but we also provide countywide services, and that's as um, a subdivision of state government. We carry out the state's uh, uh, wishes at the local level. So one of those is around justice. So the criminal justice system, if you uh, commit a felony, all felony cases are handled by, um, the, uh, by the county. And so through our superior court, uh, it's prosecuted by the prosecutor's office. And if you qualify for assigned counsel, through the, the Department of Assigned Counsel's office. And this is true of each county around Washington. What is uh, different about Washington is that Washington funds very little of our justice system. So even though they're acting on behalf of the state at the local level, very little of that funding comes from the state itself. In fact, on indigent defense, it's only 4% of what uh, statewide of what we spend on um, on uh, of the actual cost of it. Uh, so for example, the state of Washington spends about $6 million in indigent defense uh, for county government, um, whereas the total bill for Pierce County is about $20 million. So less than a third of just one county. So why is that important? Well, it means that we really don't have a system of justice in Washington. We have 39. We have justice by geography. If you get collared for a crime in King County, versus one, uh, the same crime in Grant County, the justice you experience is gonna look wildly different. 
And that's because it's up to the county government to figure out what we can uh, step up for. So while uh, Mary Kay is correct that uh, Washington overall is doing okay by comparison to say, uh, some of the states that are our peers in state funding, we're trying to meet our constitutional, what we think is a constitutional right. Uh, and that is the positive right to provide uh, 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 assigned counsel uh, when people can't provide it for themselves. But not every county is created equal when it comes to our taxing ability. So for example, uh, in Pierce County, uh, our tax burden versus, or our tax capacity versus King County is wildly different. Uh, we end up with more felony charges in, in Pierce County than in any other county, including King, and yet we have to deal with those caseloads with half the judges, prosecutors, and assigned counsel. Uh, so as you can imagine, the way we get through those cases while trying to do our best, and I, I have every bit of confidence that that that's, is what happening, um, there simply just isn't as much time to get through those cases. So what we're proposing is that the state fund it and we carry it out at the local level. That way you, we can be assured that there's a uniform system of justice around the state. We'd even accept some sort of mixed program, I think. But either way, I'll put it this way. 30 per, 31 state at states provide half of the funding for indigent defense. Half, okay? That would be uh, $10 million back to Pierce County. Now, what, what else could we do with those dollars? We could hire more defense counsel. We could hire more prosecutors, more judges. Right now, my sheriff's department is 60 uh, FTEs short, uh, and the people in the unincorporated are un, un, uh, disproportionately burdened as a result of that. Uh, we have on the, uh, on the Gig Harbor and Key Peninsula 70,000 people that are served by three officers at any, or three sheriff deputies at any given moment. The same population in Tacoma or Gig Harbor will see something along, along the lines of three or four times that kind of coverage in a much smaller geographic area. So what ends up happening is our need to fill that gap at the, uh, through our general fund and through our limited taxing ability ends up hurting other services that we need to provide. So we get back to the question, what is the, you know, who is fundamentally responsible uh, for providing this service? And if you get back to Mr. Mangia's uh, talking about the federal constitution ruling or the federal Supreme Court's ruling on, um, on indigent defense, it was a duty of the state it wasn't delegable. It wasn't something that was put on the counties. It was of the state. And so if we're falling short in any way, that burden is on the state itself. Now, I'll, I'll leave with this, uh, or end the, end the uh, um, question with this. There are four other states that uh, uh, are approximately in the same boat as us in terms of uh, funding indigent defense at the low level that we do. Uh, there are Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Indiana, I believe. Um, that is not a list you want to be on if you believe in uh, quality justice in this country. Uh, so I would submit that the state legislature needs to step up. I, I also want to point out at this point, because I know uh, Steve's going to be speaking here in a minute, uh, we have champions and detractors on this issue on both sides of the aisle uh, all over the, the area. We've, we've been pretty lucky with uh, folks here in our Pierce County delegation, so I don't want to imply that Steve is here to represent necessarily the other side of the issue because um, oh, quite a few folks are very supportive of our efforts. Unfortunately, we've had trouble getting traction, and so uh, I'll get to some potential uh, tactics on how we may push that issue here in a bit. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to question two, which is um, probably best to start with Senator Oban. What are the challenges and barriers to funding public defense adequately in Washington? If I, sure. Am I, on? I think so. No. How about now? Yes. yes. Ah, good. Okay. Let me make a, a couple of qualifying comments before I jump right into this. Uh, number one is I actually am no longer in private practice. I'm a uh, senior counsel with the county executive. So I'm, I'm about three floors down from, uh, from Derek. Um, uh, secondly, I didn't really understand the, f the, f the, uh, the topic when I um, agreed to come. <laughs> so so when, I looked, when I looked and saw that I was the only one coming from the state legislature and realized I was going to be the pinata tonight, um, I do want to say uh, I may not be the, the, the most appropriate um, advocate for the state's position. Um, I, found, I find my sympathies um, at best divided and, and frankly, um, rather sympathetic to some of the things I've already heard. And partly that's because I've been in the um, civil uh, justice system as a private practice attorney litigator for a number of years before I went to the Senate and kind of left that world completely. 
And as Sal mentioned, uh, for five wonderful, some of the most fun months I've had as a lawyer, I was a public defender when our uh, firm decided to get the public defense contract for the city of Kent and uh, give the young lawyers like me a chance to go to court and get lots of trial experience. So I did. I tried cases all day long. I just loved it. So I have fond memories of that experience, but I'm not sure I would have been um, adequate uh, under the... Uh, uh, under the uh, uh, Supreme Court definition. At any rate, um, I, I also want to say, though I, I guess I do feel some obligation to provide a little bit of the per perspective of the state when it comes now to the question before, before us this, this point of the barriers uh, to this um, sort of full funding of what probably is this, I hope I'm, I'm probably being recorded and this will be used in the court case, um, but I, I do not speak on behalf of the state, um, uh, that this is, I think, a state obligation. I mean, the, the pleading says state of Washington versus the criminally accused uh, defendant, uh, so I think it probably, uh, frankly, is. Now, I know that statutorily uh, that responsibility has been uh, delegated to hire and oversee legal defense at the county level for felonies. And um, uh, arguably, there is, uh, the county has received taxing authority uh, to raise funds for the criminal justice system, including the criminal uh, defense side of uh, things. Uh, and partly, I suppose, the reason for that is when you think of all the other demands on the uh, state FISC, uh, and, and now we'll get to some of the barriers uh, to, to sort of full funding. We just finished, a after a five-year odyssey, fully funding K-12 through education. That was after a 30-year, I think, negligence on the part of the uh, legislature, and that was before I got there, by the way, uh, <laughs> to, um, to, to uh, spend every you know, additional dollar mainly on other things rather than education, and it, it took us five years to kind of right that wrong and get the spending, I think, up to where it needed uh, to be. Um, so we sort of, we haven't heard from the state Supreme Court uh, final, uh, finally, but I expect them to say, legislature, you finally got it right, you're done, we're going to discharge our jurisdiction over you. Uh, but, it, but there are a lot of other things now uh, that comes before us. One of them is mental health, which is the policy area I've spent the most time in uh, at the Senate level and now, coincidentally, at the, at the county. Uh, we have underfunded this uh, state responsibility uh, for a number of years uh, as well and cut it uh, deeply during the Great Recession. We've got a lot of catch-up to do there uh, to provide community-based mental health care um, capacity, and I won't go into all the uh, layers of that, but uh, that's an obligation. Um, homelessness, I don't know if anybody's realized, but we have a real homelessness problem. Uh, that's, uh, I think, a, a important uh, and chiefly financial responsibility, um, both at the, at the state and local level, but certainly the state as well. The opioid prevention and um, treatment, uh, as Councilman Young knows uh, full well, is another huge issue facing it. I could go on foster care. We don't, we don't provide enough, I think, um, assistance to foster care families. Um, I mean, we're not, even, we're not even testing rape kits. We've got rape kits that have been sitting there for years untested. I mean, they're just, my point is, is there are a number of very important uh, responsibilities the state does not have funding for uh, to this point. So just so you sort of understand a little bit of uh, my world or the legislative world is there are, there are a number of other um, uh, uh, appropriate demands as well um, on uh, legislative funding. And, and yes, we could talk about new taxes and that sort of thing, but uh, frankly, the tax proposals that I've seen would not even fully address, I think, what we're talking about here, which is based on a, a fiscal note done, if we were to take over the f full responsibility of indigent, de indigent defense, it would be in this spine, it would have been $373 million that we would have needed to come up with, it sounded about right there, uh, and the next biennium, three, almost $400 million. Um, that plus all the other obligations, uh, they're just they're just is not the funding, or even with some of the the, the tax the taxes that have been proposed, I think adequate funding for those things. So when we talk about barriers. It's the other important responsibilities that, frankly, the state is at the bottom of the list. Uh, mental health, for example, and some of these other areas. Um, and um, I will say, 
feeling some obligation to represent the state uh, in this in this discussion. Uh, the state uh, did recently fully fund uh, parent representation in the de dependency uh, setting in this last uh, uh, supplemental uh, budget. I authored a bill that for the first time required that attorneys be assigned to uh, children who are in the dependency process and have, have be, um, basically have uh, ha had the rights of parents terminated, they need legal representation. I authored the bill that required that as a state obligation. So uh, there have been efforts by the state uh, to, pro to provide legal defense in s similar areas uh, with, co with constitutional uh, implications. So with that, I will end and uh, defer to others. Thank you. Um, for the purposes of time, I'm going to move on to the next question. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I went too long. You didn't go too long. <laughs> We're having an interesting discussion. Uh, at this point, I just want to remind the audience that if you have questions and you would like uh, to write them on a card, there will be students coming around and taking those cards now. I'm going to ask question number three. Um, and this, uh, with this, I'd like to um, direct uh, qu questions to um, Judge Martin and uh, to Don Farina. Um, what do you think, from your positions, are some of the consequences or the implications of um, not adequately funding public defense at the county level? I can jump in a little bit. It really is a corollary to the question one of why is it so important. Well, we, we clearly see why it is so important. The consequences of not adequately funding is you lose all of those things that were recognized as so important. The criminal justice system really is a three-legged stool. You have the the Department of Assigned Counsel. You have the prosecutor. You have the judge. You take away the depart an effective um, defense that justice system collapses, really. And um, if you look at the US Supreme Court building, it has the words equal justice under the law as you walk in. In order for equal justice to be meaningful, it cannot mean justice for those who can afford it. And um, I think what, what really goes to the importance of public defense is, is um, as um, Ms. High said, it's not just the bar card, it's not just a body, but it's meaningful representation, it's effective representation, it's adequate representation, and all of that requires resources, and it requires um, trained lawyers, it requires adequate numbers of lawyers that have reasonable caseloads, that have access to investigators, access to experts, to make the playing field fair because that's ultimately what a justice system is about is the fairness of the system and I think if you don't have an adequate public defense system that the public's confidence in that system falls apart and really it diminishes us as a democracy and as a society if you want to look at the big picture. One of my favorite authors on this subject is Brian Stevenson who wrote a book called Just Mercy and if you have not read it I cannot recommend it highly enough. It's a it's a really powerful read by someone who's devoted his life's work to um, indigent defense on capital cases and in, um, and in, in the South. Um, he's based in Alabama. But in his book, one of the things that he says is that the character of a community is not measured by how we treat the powerful and the wealthy, but rather the character of a community is measured by how we treat the indigent, the accused, the incarcerated. And um, really, that's what it's about. It, it is about ensuring that equal justice has meaning, that that constitutional right, which was recognized by the Supreme Court in Gideon versus Wayne White, is meaningful. Um, and I think the consequences of not having that is you have a system that um, isn't trusted. It isn't trusted by the participants who see that the fight is not fair. It's not trusted by the observers who watch their justice system at work. Um, but I'll turn it over to Don. And we're all, I think, equal partners, and that's what makes it work. I think people would wonder or ask the question, you know, what role does a prosecutor have in ensuring uh, an accused has adequate defense. And in fact, under the rules of professional conduct, uh, prosecutors are required to uh, ensure that an accused has uh, 
defense has an attorney representing them. Uh, as prosecutors, we are ministers of justice, not just advocates for our side. And so certainly, you know, the Sixth Amendment right for adequate um, counsel is critical. Um, but in addition to that, as a, as a prosecutor, the last thing that we want to see happen is uh, a criminal defense attorney have too many cases and not have the time to adequately prepare their case for trial, uh, go to trial, put on all our witnesses and our victims, some child victims, um, if we're trying a murder case, you know, putting through a family who's lost a loved one, to go through that process and then have the case appealed and have it overturned for ineffective assistance of counsel serves no one. Uh, it doesn't serve the defendant, the accused, it doesn't serve the community, uh, it does not serve the family who's lost their loved one or um, the child victim who has to come back to court and, and essentially testify all over again and, and suffer that emotional turmoil. So this is an important issue for, for all of us in the community and all of us in the criminal justice system. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, so I have uh, another question that I'd like to um, maybe hear from Kanani Palafox first, um, and then uh, maybe Dawn or Mary Kay, if, uh, if you want to weigh in on this. Um, what are the Pierce County's Prosecutor's Office and Office of Assigned Counsel already doing, Mary Kay, you hinted at this, um, to combat um, issues with regard to inadequate funding? Um, so I can speak on, on my uh, job right now as, as a legal assistant at the Pierce County Pro Prosecutor's Office. Um, our job is to kind of streamline the process for our attorneys um, to make an appearance in court so that they are prepared. Um, and, and that can mean preparing legal discovery for um, to give to defense. Um, so we have a really great working relationship with the Department of Assigned Counsel. Um, we have this system in place where we can take our legal discovery and put it on a computer and it's easily accessible for the Department of Sign Council to have access to. Um, so we, we do have a great working relationship with them and, and um, I'm sure that could be said on to my counterpart at the Department of Assigned Council. So. I would also add to that um, when if you have too many cases, as I, Mary Kay was mentioning earlier, if you have too many cases that you're handling, both from prosecutors and from the defense perspective, you're not really effectively and adequately representing your client. And so in 2009, when our elected prosecutor, Mark Lindquist, um, was uh, elected into, onto the, into the office, his first order of business was reducing the backlog of cases in superior Court. And what that means is we had over 2,100 pending felony cases in Superior Court, not including all the new cases that were coming in every day. And because we had such a backlog of cases, nothing was getting resolved. Cases were not being tried, um, and you know they just were not getting resolved. And so what we did, we worked closely with the Department of Assigned Counsel and with the Superior Court and came up with a, a system to get through that backlog and so that we could effectively manage these cases and each of them could be handled in an effective manner. And we started out at 2,100 pending. And I believe Judge Martin, we're down to about 1,400. 14. Yep. So we've done an amazing job thanks to the uh, collaboration and cooperation with the Department of Assigned Counsel and um, Superior Court. Mary Kay, would you like to weigh in a little bit? Sure. Um, we've just heard about collaboration working in a typically adversarial system. But one of the things that I see at DAC that really helps us combat what could be a looming crisis, perhaps in other areas not here, is that we're able to recruit and retain really highly motivated, qualified, and committed attorneys. Um, we have uh, lawyers that are drawn to this work and committed to this work. This is not the path to wealth and popularity, but it is something that really is a bone deep commitment. And so we have lawyers that are willing to dedicate their careers and like I said, become very, very skilled advocates. 
and really know how to assess a case, know what case needs the investigator, what one needs this expert, and are very good stewards of the money given um, and knowing when and how to spend it to pursue the, the aims and the, the needs of their clients. Judge Martin, did you want to weigh in on this question as well? Um, well, I think we have a, a really terrific justice partners in um, Pierce County, both on the prosecutor's side and the uh, Department of Assigned Counsel. And one of the things that I've observed, too, is the, the way that collaboratively we're also taking on some of those other challenges within our community, such as mental health. We've really been working hard on those issues because that profoundly affects our criminal justice system. But I also think um, one of the other consequences that I really failed to talk about that's really important is the disproportionality that happens if you don't, if, if you end up without um, adequate public defense, you end up um, exacerbating what already is a disproportionality in the criminal justice system of persons from marginalized communities. Um, they need that voice um, because they don't have a voice in, within our society um, necessarily. And, and so um, that's really important. That's true of the mentally ill and true of those others from marginalized communities. And I think our um, justice system here in Pierce County does a particularly good job of trying to ensure that um, the voiceless are heard, that um, there are adequate resources to make sure that um, everyone who um, is, is entitled to that fair trial gets that fair trial. So I think a lot is working. That's not to say we don't have challenges. We absolutely have challenges, and um, all of us have them. And um, I know our legislative and executive branch partners are also working with us to meet some of those challenges. So there's a lot of good things that are working, but um, funding is certainly a challenge on meeting some of those issues um, as well, as we all look for creative solutions. Thank you. Well, I come to the core, right? Um, so we're talking about what's working, um, but also we have to come back to kind of what are the challenges, right? Um, so uh, Councilman Young brought up this issue of um, the costs and that Pierce County is, is really shouldering a lot of these costs. Um, uh, Senator O'Ban brought up the, the difficulties, the barriers with the legislature fully funding um, public defending. So uh, I'm going to probably start with Senator Orban and come over to Councilman Young. Who should shoulder the biggest costs of funding public defense and why? I think Derek Young should shoulder the, the <laughs> cost. <laughs> well, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit divided on this topic, but I will, I will um, – uh, soldier on and, and represent the state's uh, uh, interest <laughs> in this uh, debate. Thank this. you for playing along, Senator. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, here, here's the principle I guess I'll lay out that I think um, at least should uh, guide this discussion um, in all the different um, venues it's probably going to uh, have, and that is I think government works best where, where those responsible for the decision making, in this case the hiring, the, the, the supervision uh, of uh, criminal uh, indigent de defense should also be the same decision makers w when it comes to actually the funding of it. So if if the county, as it has for I don't know how long, but for well, certainly before I ever uh, thought about running for elective office, uh, if it's the county that does does the hiring and and does the supervision and and uh, addresses the the quality issues that we've talked about. Um, then, then I would suggest it, sh it should continue on with the funding um, requirements. If, however, the decisions made, the state needs to, to bear the burden of this chiefly, uh, then I think um, it would be best then for the state to be have a much more active role than in overseeing how uh, that defense gets, um, gets done in, in an effective manner. I think that's always the challenge that you have with uh, areas like this where this, the, the state has a primary funding role like education, and yet it's diffused as to how that money then gets spent. And I won't go into all the challenges we faced in, in dealing um, with uh, the McCleary decision and, and fully funding uh, education, but it was made extremely complicated and difficult because you had 
uh, school boards that were basically for a number of years deciding how that money got spent and in a number of different ways and some on basic education, taking basic, basic, basic education dollars and spending other things and vice versa. So I would, if we're going to revisit this issue, um, I, I'm going to be, I guess, asking the question anyway of my colleagues in Olympia, then we need to um, retain um, a, a fair amount of responsibility then for how those funds then get uh, spent at the at the local level. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see, uh, it, given a difficult case to defend, um, Senator Oban has done a great job, <laughs> and so I think he would have met those standards uh, for a public <laughs> defender. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, so what what this all comes back to is 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 prioritization it, you know it is true that uh, the state has a number of uh, issues that it's juggling difficult thorny issues they recently got through a big one i mean i'm hoping that you've gotten through that uh, i guess we'll find out soon but the uh, but there's uh, behavioral health as an emerging crisis homelessness all these things are, are huge issues. In fact, they're under federal mandate right now for, uh, under the Trueblood decision for uh, failing to uh, adequately provide comp for competency evaluations for people suffering from behavioral health crisis that were languishing in our jails for months on end uh, without getting in front of a, a, a mental health professional to determine if they're uh, fit to stand trial. You know, that to me is like, I mean, in your base level of justice, provision of justice, that's the worst outcome is somebody who is overstaying their um, their potential sentence for a misdemeanor collar in our jail because they can't get in front of a judge is uh, that to me is an even worse or more egregious violation of justice but if we can get that settled I think this is the next thing because um, you know the way I, I look at it, and I'll pick on our friends to the north in Seattle is they often tell us uh, in response well we've given you other tools that you can adopt locally to uh, to increase you know tax revenue so that you can pay for this. Uh, the problem with that is that we have a largely sales tax based uh, system and county governments only collect sales tax outside the cities where the bulk of the businesses are. For example, I have one county who the, on the only time they collect any sales tax is when the state comes through and paves the highway because all of the businesses are located or it's so rural that you know all of the businesses are either located in a town or in another county. So they could pass every sales, every sales tax provision, every you know other uh, idea that uh, um, you know some folks in more urban areas come up with and think is adequate to uh, fought, to pay for uh, public defense. The truth is, it won't raise a nickel for them. So what we have, what we come back to is uniformity, and this is a this is a state constitutional issue, and it says that the uh, state of Washington should provide for a uniform system of county government. We do not have a uniform system in county government when it comes to our justice system. I mean, that's easily demonstrated by the vast differences between what you see in King County and Pierce County alone, but it gets even more exasperated when you go around the state to the more rural counties. Um, and in terms of prioritization, I, I, I would submit to you that this session was a demonstration of why counties are so frustrated. Um, as uh, Senator Oban uh, would, would agree, because I've seen him talk and write about this at great length, uh, when the legislature came into $1.2 billion of unanticipated revenue this special session. So this is not, you know, a new budget session. This was a new revenue forecast. Good news, right? So county governments, we all came together and said, okay, this is our year to make progress. They've knocked down the McCleary problem. They got $1.2 billion in new uh, funding. This should be no problem to start making some progress this year. Instead, we got $15.5 million worth of new unfunded mandates. So, and this is indicative of a broader problem. It's not just on indigent defense, it's on uh, county funding as a whole, because we have tax caps that have been passed by the legislature capping our property tax. 70% of my revenue comes from property tax and is limited beneath the rate of inflation. So it slowly strangles us over time. The second is that they uh, have cut shared revenue. Even just this last session, cannabis revenue, which was the newest uh, uh, piece of uh, uh, money that was coming from the state, was swept to pay for the McCleary decision. Um, that cut another, uh, uh, I was able to uh, pay for another five deputies with those uh, dollars. And then finally, the new unfunded mandates that come every year. It's an order to do something without the funding that comes with it. Often the state legislature, you, you see it in the fiscal note, it's a state, uh, state fiscal note, this much, and they always fund that. Local fiscal note, and there's a little red you know, notation there. 
This is a great example of it. So um, we've reached a crisis point, and this is the one that we're going to, not only because it's important from a justice uh, uh, delivery standpoint, but also because it's a federal constitutional obligation and one that we think uh, that, the, uh, that the courts will uphold. I have audience questions. And actually, one of the audience questions is, is it unconstitutional if the state does not pay for public defense? And I'd like to hear from maybe one or two of the other panelists. Um, so you've heard uh, Councilman Young's position on that. Would any of the other panelists like to weigh on, in on whether it's unconstitutional? Don't be I've got an even more uncomfortable <laughs> okay, one well. next. <laughs> uh, I read Gideon, uh, Gideon's Room, but by the way, great book, good movie. Um, uh, well, if if it's if the we've fallen below the standard, the constitutional standard, which the courts will uh, have already weighed into in terms of at least caseload ratios and so forth, um, I think that's. I think that's going to be the, the seminal issue. And, and to Councilman Young's point, you, you'll probably look at those counties outside of King <laughs> that don't have the revenue sources. And if they are unable to um, fund uh, that adequate defense as the, as the court has defined it, then uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that would be the outcome. You know, and it, yeah. Just uh, an aside, I think 23 states have some level of state funding, um, all or partial. A number of states have some terrible ideas, like Louisiana will pay for it with like traffic tickets, um, things like that. And you know, so I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. But having a state-funded system is not a, a guarantee that you're going to have a constitutional uh, defender system. And unfortunately, some of the states that are state-funded are the worst offenders, you know, when you're looking at some of the ones that are making the headlines, like Missouri or Tennessee. So um, it, it needs a lot of thought. That's a good yeah. point. That's fair. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have one more audience question that we have time for before we need to get to our kind of final question for the panel. Um, and I, I kind of like this one myself. Um, how does the budget of the prosecutor's office compare to the budget of the assigned counsel office? <laughs> and um, can panelists speak to that? Well, I can tell you the prosecutor's budget is uh, approximately $30 million. We have over 200 um, employees. Uh, we are responsible for different pieces of, of things in the criminal justice system that the, the Department of Assigned Counsel are not. We, we um, review over 17,000 uh, criminal cases every year. Uh, we charge approximately 50% of those in, fe in the felony division. Um, we work closely with law enforcement on um, investigations and, and that sort of thing and, and educating not only law enforcement on proper procedures and the law, but also um, educating the community uh, so we do have a larger budget than the Department of Assigned Counsel, but our roles are, are different. Um, and uh, our budget's about $19 million, and uh, we have uh, 85 attorneys, approximately, um, and I would say with staff somewhere around 125, 130 people. And we represent, like I said, over 90% of individuals that are... Uh, accused of a crime, but we also represent individuals in other uh, areas as, as well that are deserving and are entitled to attorneys. You know, one of the things is, you know, we at the Department of Assigned Counsel, we have no control over the number of cases filed that require appointment of counsel. Um, those decisions, whether it's by an attorney uh, general in uh, our, some of the areas that we practice or by the prosecuting attorney office, I know they're taking into account certain factors, but I really doubt that the availability of a public defense funds is actually one of those. So, I mean, we really try to do our best to project and, uh, you know, use the money uh, wisely um, and uh, to be very good stewards of, of the money that we do receive. Thank you. So I'm, a, I'm aware that Senator Oban needs to... If I could just add one quick thing, sure. just to, since I'm the one that pays for both of their budgets. Uh, <laughs> I, I, just to be clear, uh, there, I think uh, Don was kind of alluding to another mm -hmm. aspect of that, but uh, the prosecutor's office is also has a civil division, and they're literally my lawyer. 
Uh, so the, in addition to uh, dealing with the uh, the criminal side, they also have that um, that civil side that they you know deal with. Anytime we get sued, you know the the county uh, prosecutor's office is dealing with those as well. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. So um, Senator Ban has another event that he needs to attend after this. We're very grateful for his time. So I'm going to move into our final question for the panel, and I'm going to start with you, okay. um, if that's okay. Sure. So I've asked uh, each of the panelists to think about if they could suggest at least one action. What can we take away from this discussion? Um, if you could suggest at least one action to be taken on this issue, what would it be? Derek, please don't sue us. That would be my one. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, this has been a great discussion just for my own benefit. I'm not sure I've had a sustained discussion on this issue um, in my legislative role. So um, I, th and, and I'm unaware of, of what effort there has been, Derek would know, um, to try to educate other lawmakers on these issues. But, uh, but, but I guess given my own experience uh, as a great um, supporter of the adversarial system in the civil and criminal context where you have to have adequate representation on both sides for the you know the facts and hopefully justice to come forth um, in a fair manner um, I, I I don't have to be talked into the importance of making sure that the system is, is adequately uh, funded and I and I understand that this is a constitutional obligation and, and it should be uh, for all the reasons we've discussed what's the action item you're asking for I think it's um, uh, maybe maybe a lawsuit is is I'll let the others uh, make that decision. But I I think this is um, a discussion uh, that's very timely. And now that we've got the McCleary uh, monkey off our back, that's probably not a good way of putting it, since it was such an important issue to uh, to make sure our kids get educated. But um, but now that we have that issue that was sucking so much of our energy, um, sort of, I think, behind us, this, this and mental health, I think, are probably two very critical issues um, for us to take up. Uh, and so I'm hoping we, we, we have more discussion like this. I'm, I'm guessing you'll have a pretty sympathetic audience um, from, from many of us in the legislature. So keep the discussion going. We will keep the discussion going. Thank okay. you. Can we thank Senator Sorry. Urban for his contribution? So I think I'd like to come to this side of the table and kind of mix it up a little bit. Is that all right with you, Judge Martin? Um, would you mind speaking to this? What do you think we should take away? Well, I, I'm not going to be advocating any specific thing. I think that this forum is very good because I think it's really important that the public be engaged on this issue and understand um, the importance of adequate resources throughout the criminal justice system um, because um, I think it's it's easy if you're not personally involved in it, you've never been charged with a crime, no one in your family's ever been charged, that you may not understand what the value that comes from um, an adequate system. And I think it's really important to understand that um, it is it is not just um, somebody you don't know. Um, it, it, everyone is harmed by a system that does not work and everyone in society as a whole benefits from a system that does work, um, that works fairly and that has adequate resources to meet um, the needs. A lot of these issues are interrelated. We talked about mental health. We talk about other issues that have impacts on the criminal justice system and, and it's, it's a complicated issue um, because it is so interrelated. Um, and I'm not in a position to talk about funding and that's you know, we're, we're the ones that try the cases, but our job is made so much more difficult if we don't have um, uh, our, a, a prosecuting office and a DAC office that have the adequate resources to, to meet the needs because we don't control how, what's funded and uh, what's filed either. I don't even think the prosecutor's office does. And everything we can do to improve the quality of our community, whether it's homelessness or it's mental health or other issues, also has an impact on the, the numbers of people coming into the criminal justice system. So all of it is, you can't take just one small piece of it and say if we fix that, then everything's fine. Um, it's all interrelated. And um, this is a very important dialogue. So I think public education, like we've had tonight, is just really valuable to understand that we all have a role to play. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Kanani, I was wondering if you could, as a UWT graduate, um, but also as someone who works uh, with the Office of Sign Council and has and has worked with, the, sorry, you work with the prosecutor's office currently and has worked with the offices of Sign Council. Um, what do you think we should take away from this? Yeah, um, so as a UW student, I was given the opportunity to work um, at the Department of Sign Council as an investigative intern. And um, during my time there, I sat across the table from accused um, who are in Pierce County Jail. And um, a lot of the time I sat there wondering, why were their lives so vastly different than my life? And we live in the same community. We walk the same sidewalks. We went to the same schools, but my life is so different than theirs. Um, so my understanding of the criminal justice system was deepened because of that. And it, it you know, differed from what I saw in the media watching Judge Judy and Law and Order, but it, it came to the to humanity and the significance of that. Um, so I, I do second that, Judge Martin, that this is a very big topic and very complex, but um, we have to start with our community and doing more outreach programs and whether that's going to the schools and teaching our youth about the criminal justice system, opening our doors, you know, the court to, you know, tours for youth to see that because it's such a normal thing in Pierce County to, um, to have a family member in the criminal justice system or a friend or someone you knew. And so I think it's important for us to create an environment of learning for people in our community um, so it's not connected to our families, but it's connected to learning and engagement. So that's what I would like to see. Great. Thank you. Um, Derek, I'm going to give you the last word. Don't worry. <laughs> um, uh, Mary Kay, would you like to go next? Well, I think we need to do a better job of identifying who should not be in the system. Um, we have data from an Annie E. Casey Foundation grant that looked at our youth in the juvenile system. We found a disproportionate impact that continues focusing on uh, kids of color. Kids of, and the other thing that we know that once you're in the system, it's very easy to be dragged further and further in, and it's going to have lifelong effects. Let's maybe look at some of the root causes and what kind of supports that families and youth need, and really to take away what we were look, uh, just talking about mental health, um, homelessness. I think that if we can look at folks that really shouldn't be in the system and, try, and use that uh, expertise, use the funds, use our, our efforts to um, keep them from being in a criminal justice system, we're, we're going to have, a, a, we can make a lot of uh, strides. You know, we can still keep our community safe, but really address and provide the services and benefits uh, for an individual that will keep them from coming back and coming back and coming back. And it's like you said, with our, our mental health issues uh, right now are things that we are trying to work on together, all of us, everyone, you know, in, in this room here um, to make a difference. Uh, we also have an opioid crisis, as we know. We see that with families. We see it in dependency court. We see it in the juveniles. We see it, um, we see it with our adults. So what can we do that will address some of these things that can reduce the number of cases and in the long run really lead to better lives for citizens in Pierce County? Okay, thank you. We're getting some really interesting and diverse answers. So, Don, would you like to give thank us you. your thoughts? Well, I couldn't agree more uh, with Mary Kay, what she said, and, and Judge Martin. Um, certainly, we're doing our part in the prosecutor's office to come up with uh, diversion programs where we can send these cases, these individuals, into diversion as opposed to in the criminal justice system. Um, since I have uh, Councilmember Young here, uh, we are requesting from the council uh, for 150,000, Council Member Young, for a, a new juvenile diversion program to divert kids out of the juvenile justice system and into a really wonderful mentoring program, which will then allow them to kind of learn from mentors in the community and move in a completely different direction so we never see them in the adult court. Um, it's a small cost to the county, and it would be such a benefit for the juveniles and for this community, um, and it would then lower the number of cases that we see in adult court. Uh, in addition, we've talked a lot tonight about homelessness, mental health issues, uh, drug addiction. Um, we as a team here are working really hard to divert these individuals into veterans courts, drug, drug court, um, 
and various other alternatives and therapeutic courts, mental health, the True Blood, which you've heard a little bit about today, is the mental health crisis that we're dealing with. This is another thing that we're working on thanks to a grant we received. Um, we're diverting pre-charge diversion cases, uh, mental health cases, to uh, treatment in the community. Again, trying to keep these cases out of our criminal justice system. So I think we're, we continue to work together. We continue to come up with innovative ways to uh, not uh, charge these cases, low-level low cases, and, and really divert them into programs that are going to help these individuals lead productive lives. But in conclusion, what I would say, and I, I agree with Councilmember Young, when the state sends mandates to the counties, um, they need to fund those mandates. Excellent. Thank you. Councilmember Young. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you all for being here. Um, so I, I, I hate to keep coming back to this, but it, most of everything that you, you heard here, whether it's uh, you know, trying to, to fix the system so that people who shouldn't be in the criminal justice system um, aren't. Uh, so that whether it's treating an underlying behavioral health uh, disorder, uh, uh, tackling the opioid uh, epidemic, um, uh, diversion for juveniles who before they get too far into the system, uh, all of those things uh, are things that we can actually do if it wasn't for this giant unfunded mandate. That The cost of that is $20 million out of my budget. That's doubled in the last 10 years. Uh, I can tell you that my, my uh, revenue has not doubled in that same time. So where does that money come from? It comes from uh, dollars that we would have spent on behavioral health services, uh, it, dollars that we would put in the streets for deputies that are badly understaffed. It comes from the fact that we have two vacant uh, positions that are authorized by the legislature and the courts. We, have, we are understaffed in the prosecutor's office and the DAC. Uh, pretty much everywhere you look, there are fixes in the system that can come from the state legislature fund, fully funding indigent defense. Because the fa fact is that we're not going to, and we, uh, you know, as much as I, I think that all of my colleagues are in the same position around the state, we're in a position where we're not going to let our constitutional obligation to our citizens fall. You know, we're going to provide that. But that does mean that there are cuts elsewhere. So if I'm asking all of you to take an action, it's contact your legislators. Tell them to do this. Uh, you know, we're trying to ramp up the, the volume this year uh, because two years ago when we first started talking about this, we got blank stares. What do you mean? Why would the state fund this county service? It's, it's only now beginning to take hold. And so if they hear from their citizens that this is something that you value, that you want a more just system uh, for people that are in the justice system, um, then they, we may be able to make a little progress in this next session. Okay. Uh, can we join me in thanking our panelists? And that's all we have for tonight. Thank you very much for coming out and uh, I encourage you to keep talking about this topic.